One day, while exploring the road north of the Jury Street Metro, we find a pack of wild dogs okay. guarding a choke point in a ravine. Heading through the ravine, we see a chain link fence off to the left. There doesn't appear to be anything beyond it, just a bunch of rock. The fence, however, is totally broken, and just outside it is a big yellow sign. Fallout Shelter. It's then that we notice a door in the side of the rock. Heading down the slope, we see that this is the door to Vault 106. We arrive in a dark and dusty tunnel. The entrance is littered with tin cans and boxes, but despite these signs of human habitation, the vault door at the very end of this cavern is still closed. Using our Pip-Boy, we can activate the vault door control pod to the right of the door. The entrance to Vault 106 is similar to all of the other ones we have found in the Capital Wasteland. There is always a chance that a closed vault door means this was a control vault, but it's clear now that that's likely not the case. The entrance is just as cluttered as the cavern beyond the door. Barrels, tin cans, clipboards, garbage, and here, our first sign of violence. Blood on the floor next to the controls. The blood forms a trail over towards these lockers, but the lockers are mostly empty except for the last one. And here we find a combat helmet. Perhaps this was used by Vault Security, but where is security now? Turning around, we see a door that leads deeper into the vault, but first we need to explore this alcove to the east. There are a few consoles and shipping containers, nothing we can interact with, so heading out, we can go through the northern door into the vault. We arrive in a large vaulted chamber, and peering up, we see pipes snaking this way and that. It's unusual to see such an elaborate network of pipes exposed like this, and some of them are still pouring some sort of air or gas. I hope it's not poisonous. We find a door in front of us and a door to the right. The door in front of us, however, is broken. We see that a bookshelf is lodged between the floor and the door, but the door is also askew. I don't think we're going to be able to open this. After looting a few toolboxes, our only choice is to open the door to the east. This brings us to a hallway lined with a yellow stripe, which leads to another door before which is a bunch of blood. On the other side of the door, we find two more doors, one to the east and one to the south. The one to the south has some sort of window in the wall. We'll start here first, and we see even more blood in front of the door. This door is locked with a very easy lock. On the other side, we see more tables tipped over as barricades. What were they protecting themselves from? And at last, we find our first remains. A skeleton lies on the ground between a bookshelf. But then... Uh-oh. That can mean only one thing. Checking our compass, we see a red mark. Oh! Hello? Oop. Where? Look what oh. We get attacked by an insane survivor. So they're not dead, but they're all insane? We see that he's armed with a combat knife. He was coming to kill us, and he wears a Vault 106 jumpsuit, giving us the impression that he is indeed a dweller of this vault. As we loot the vault suit, however, we see that he's suffering from something. The veins on his leg are thrombosed, bulging out as if his heart was beating too fast. What, did he have some sort of disease? Was he suffering from an ailment? Could that be the reason why he's insane? Heading back into the room, we can more closely examine these skeletons. We notice that this one was holding a laser pistol in his right hand. And moving off to the northeast, we find another skeleton lying next to another laser pistol. So these two dwellers really did barricade themselves in this room and defended themselves to the death. Were they killed by other vault dwellers who had gone insane? Well, if so, why didn't these ones go insane? 
There's a shelf to the east with junk and scrap, and to the southwest are three lockers, but all are empty. All that's left in this room is a very hard-locked security terminal. This requires a hacking skill of 100 or more, but if successful, we only find one note. Urgent security notice. To Vault Security, if any of our residents notice any unusual odor or faint taste to the air, please assure them that everything is okay. There was a slight irregularity in our filtration system, but nothing to cause alarm. The systems have already been corrected and are 100% functional again. If you notice anyone acting out in a strange manner, please report the disturbance immediately so medical assistance can be sent. The Overseer. Okay, so something went haywire with their air filtration system. They corrected it quickly, but why would the Overseer then say to look out for anyone acting in a strange manner? Did the Overseer expect something like that to happen? Heading out of security, we can continue by turning right through the door where the insane Vault Dweller attacked us. This brings us to a T-junction. Both left and right lead to staircases bringing us down. Taking a look at the local map doesn't really tell us anything right now, but looking on the ground, we see blood at the top of the staircase to the left. We'll start by heading left. At the bottom of the stairs, we see a door to the left and another staircase leading down to the right. Well, let's go through this door to the left first. Oh, scientists. Wait, Dad? Oh, what just happened? Those scientists. All three of those scientists looked uncannily like James, the Lone Wanderer's father. Did we just hallucinate that? Oh god, maybe something really is in the air. Examining the nearby lockers, we find a full suit of recon armor in one and some bottle caps in the other, but nothing else in this room. So turning around, we can instead go down this other staircase. At the bottom, we see more blood, but before we can examine it... Thought I heard something. Help me. Oh, I tell you, bastard. Well. Ah. Oh. Don't you mess with me. Two more insane survivors. They have enough of their mental faculties to speak, but they don't stop to even address us. They just charge. They came from this room to the left. Looks like a reactor room. Before we explore it, let's head out and open this door to the right. This just leads to a storage room. We find a few lockers, but all of them are empty. Heading out and turning right, the other door here leads back into the reactor room. The reactor appears to still be functional, but everything else in this room is in ruins or rusted. We find an alcove to the east, and again, more tables laid down as barricades. Aside from a few boxes with minor loot, there's nothing in here. This then appears to be a dead end. So retracing our steps, we head up two flights of stairs, to this time cross the hall, and go down the staircase to the south. As we round the corner, Dad? Racing forward as fast as we can, we can open the door. And he's gone. What is going on? Why do we keep seeing James? On the other side of this wall, we see three lockers, a stack of darts in one, and a full suit of combat armor in the other. This must have been another research lab. Lots of tables covered in coffee cups and coffee machines. Another chemistry set to the northeast with a couple of scorched books on top. But wait a minute. There's something peeking out from underneath one of these books. We find a torn out journal entry. Copying it to our Pip-Boy. Journal entry E6243. For some reason, today the air is different. I can't quite place it, but the air tastes a little blue, I guess? As weird as that sounds, the air tastes blue. Blue like my suit. That kind of rhymes. Weird. Weird beard. <laughs> I always wanted to be a beatnik, but the pants were too tight. Okay. Well, looks like whatever malfunction with the air filtration system they had led to some unusual events here. But this guy sounded like an easygoing hippie. Easygoing hippies don't typically turn insane and start attacking. There must be more to this story. Turning this lab upside down doesn't reveal much else, so heading out we can cross the hall, past some old dried blood on the ground, into another lab. This one has a large switchboard and a projector. We also see a bank of servers against the western wall, but we sadly can't interact with anything. So to continue, we need to head out and go east down the hallway. This brings us to another staircase going down. And rounding this corner, more dads. 
Okay. Racing forward, which one do we follow? There were three of them turning right. <sighs> Lost them again. We are going crazy down here. And this room is torn to pieces. Tipped over shelves, broken terminals, chairs on tables, scrap and trash everywhere. We see more large computers. And moving south, we see some lockers to the east with a full suit of recon armor in one. I'm thinking this must have been a library. We find four tables covered in terminals at the back of this room, but we sadly can't access any of them. The door here leads back out into the hallway. The room across the hall is a wreck, but nothing interesting in here. Heading out and down the hallway, we can open the door to the left. This is another one James walked through, but inside is more of the same. Lots of signs of violence and attempts at self-defense, but nothing we can read or interact with. Back down the hallway, we can round the corner that James did, only to find another staircase leading down and deeper into the vault. This door leads to the Vault 106 living quarters. We arrive in the atrium and immediately get attacked by more insane survivors. We're on the top floor of the atrium. We see doors all over the place. And there's the overseer's office. I wonder if he's still alive. We'll start by opening this door to the right, but this just leads to a hallway. A hallway that leads downstairs. We want to explore this top level first, so we'll head back for now. Moving south, we see one of the catwalks completely blocked up with furniture, and turning around, we see more tipped over tables. I can only imagine what this battle must have looked like. To the right, we see empty beer bottles, plates, cutlery and a frag mine. These tables must have been defended by vault security. And to the left, we see another note lying on a table behind a monitor. Scribbles. Scribbledy bibbledy hoodly hoo. Wing wing brick a bang choo choo choo. Upside popsicle tastes like blue. Ghosts in the hall go boo boo boo. Oh, okay. Hi, everything's fine. <laughs> After all, this likely happened a long time ago. And whatever was affecting the air here has likely all evaporated away. Right? The door to the south is locked with a hard lock. We have to either hunt for a key card that opens this door, or if we have 100 lock picking, we can pick it. The door opens, leading to another yellow striped hallway. The hallway turns left, where we can open a door to the overseer's office, but... Oh, the Overseer is still alive. Oh, wait, but that vault suit says 101. Alphonse? <laughs> man, come on, man, this isn't even right. That was Alphonse Almodovar, the Overseer we grew up with in Vault 101, the father of our best childhood friend, Amata. A man we possibly killed, depending on how we choose to escape Vault 101. This vault is messing with our heads. He has a corner filled with goods, including a Red Rider tricycle, and a footlocker on the ground with a small store of caps. On one of the bookshelves, we find a box with some detergent in it, but the detergent is hiding two stim packs. If we shake them out, we can loot them. On the top of the shelf is a first aid kit, and when done looting, we can read the overseer's terminal, but it's locked with a very hard lock. We could wait until we find a key that opens this, or if our skill is high enough, we can hack it. Inside, we find one item. Urgent preparations report. The ventilation system has been checked and the required security and medical protocols have been initiated as per instructions in preparation for release of the control. The following systems have been brought online. V shafts 00209, 437, 518, and 518C. The following systems have been disconnected. V shafts 14 and 83A through D. The following security precautions have also been completed. Security protocol 5146A, camera protocol 52 overseer, and medical protocol 92 med alert. I have overseen all preliminary tests and can assuredly say we are ready and prepared for the worst. Well, clearly the overseer was deadly wrong here. But we gather from this terminal that they were expecting some of the dwellers to go insane. Why were they expecting them to go insane? I thought this was due to a fault in the ventilation filtering system. Could it have anything to do with the release of the control that the overseer mentioned in this terminal? But what control? What does he mean by control? 
We don't find a staircase beneath this desk, so it looks like there was no way out for this overseer. He, or whatever remains of him, is likely still in here. But this is a dead end, so retracing our steps, we arrive back at the atrium, and now we can walk across a catwalk to loot the bodies of the insane survivors who attacked us. The eastern door leads to a bit of a schoolroom. All the desks are tipped over. There's a projector in the corner and a stack of boxes on the teacher's desk. Well, I wonder what these can be hiding. Taking them off one by one and shaking them out, we find a copy of Nikola Tesla and you hiding in the bottom one. Heading out and turning left, we find the last door in this upper part of the atrium to the east. This room has more computer servers, one empty locker, and a door to the south. Opening the door, we pass a bunch of privacy screens to open another door to the east, where we find... Thought I I've got one. Something. There's more where that came from. This must have been the doctor's office. Those privacy screens we passed are medical equipment, and we see big surgical lights hanging from the ceiling. There's a row of lockers by the door, which has some armor and caps inside, and this entire room shows signs of a struggle. We even find a pile of cinder blocks lying on the ground to the east, next to a bookshelf, and upon the bookshelf is the science bobblehead. You found a vault limited edition bobblehead. The inscription on the base reads, Always be prepared to explain the hows and the whys. Your science skill has been permanently increased by 10 points. After looting other minor containers, we can peer out the windows where we see the interior of a cave. So it looks like vault found a naturally forming cave to build their vault in. Could whatever have affected the ventilation system seeped into the vault from out there? We can peer through the windows on either side, but all we see is glowing fungus and brain fungus, nothing else, which makes this a dead end. This leaves one path forward, and that's to head back into the atrium to go down to the lower floor. Peering over the ledge, it's a mess down there. Heading through the northwestern door, we can at last take the staircase down. On the atrium floor level, we round a corner to pass a bookshelf covered in all sorts of goodies, lots of boxes to tip out and tip over, a couple of first aid boxes, and a ton of scrap. Of note, we find one Mentats in one of the boxes. Continuing around the corner, we find another bookshelf with a Fragmine box, a grenade box, and loads and loads of turpentine, for some reason. The door to the east opens up to the atrium floor. We don't find any hostiles here, but we see lots of blood spatter. We'll explore it in a counterclockwise fashion. The first door to the right leads to a bit of a supply room. There's an ammunition box, a box of shotgun shells, and some darts in a tipped over bookshelf. Lots of other containers and boxes to toss out on the other shelves. Notably, we find two more frag mines, another box of shotgun shells, another ammo box, one more mintats in a box, and in this box, I thought I saw a radex, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't seem to wiggle this one out, so I just left it. Darts, pre-war money, another Rad X on the top level of a shelf, and one final ammunition container. Heading out and turning right, we see a puddle of blood on the ground with streaks leading to a door to the south. Well, I think that's where we're supposed to go. But before we do, let's finish exploring this room. The residents had piled furniture and boxes in the middle of the atrium. I think they may have tried to climb these boxes to get up high as far away from the insane survivors as possible. We see a billiard table, lots of junk and scrap all over the ground, and we complete the loop to find a door to the north. Opening it up leads to a dark hallway, and the walls are covered in the grime of ages. But as we step forward, whoo, suddenly everything turns clean and so blue. There are working computers to the right and working computers to the left. Going into the leftmost room first, we see terminals to the right, but we can't access them. A mainframe in the middle of the room, but we can't access it. But then we find a terminal that we can access to me? Your Brain Softworks version me. A note to me. This place is great. I think it's time to accept the new and embrace this change. Relax. Well, I have to admit, this is a really clean room, and my home, Megaton, well, that's filthy. Maybe we should relax. Moving on to the next one, to me. Another note to me. Come on, don't you like it better here? Breathe deep in the blue. Relax. 
Well, blue is one of my favorite colors. And I'm right, there is a bit of a blue tint in this room. And that blue just smells so nice. We see more terminals over here. The next one, to me. Please read me. Seriously, this place has everything we need. Enjoy it while we're here. Oh, I want to. I could kick up my feet and relax, but what about Dad? We still have to find James. And the next one, to me. Fine. Be that way. I have nothing more to say to you. We're through here. Uh-oh. Did I just make myself mad? We can access the terminal on the other side of this one, but we find the same thing. Fine. Be that way. Checking some of the terminals we already read, we see the messages have changed. Fine. Be that way. Heading out of this room and crossing the hallway, we can open the opposite door and this room is equally clean with a hint of blue. And the terminals here all say the same thing. Fine, be that way. There's nothing more here for us. So to continue, we go back to the hallway, face north and walk into the dark. Creeping closer, we see that this is the top of a staircase. But as we get closer, oh, Everything is rusty and filthy again. Looking back the way we came, the clean walls are now ruined by time. Turning around, we see blood at the bottom of the stairs and rounding the corner. <laughs> Continuing down to the bottom level, we arrive in a large room. We see windows to the left and a room beyond. Strange that these windows have bars on them. And then a door to the south. This brings us down a staircase and to another long hallway. Creeping forward. Amata? Three Amatas charged us before vanishing. Amata, the lone wanderer's best friend whom we left back in Vault 101. This hallway leads to a room where we find two doors, one on either side. The left door leads to the male dorm and the right to the female dorm. We'll start by going into the male dorm. We find the dorm downstairs, and at the bottom of the stairs, we see three more doors. Which one do we choose? Well, we'll go left first, since it's open. And immediately to the left, we see another note on top of this desk. Feel the love, man. Oh, man. I just had to get my thoughts on paper, man. Otherwise, the cat in my head forgets, man. The sky is as blue as it used to be. I'm so happy to be here, and my roomies are flailing around in the love mist. I can't remember what I was doing before, but man, is it great here now. I never thought about it like this before, but the walls just need somebody to love too, man. So whatever is being pumped into this vault is not only affecting their personalities, their moods, but it's affecting their vision as well. Everything feels, looks, and tastes blue. And as we saw upstairs, we are being affected by it too. Heading out, we can next explore the eastern door. This leads to another bedroom, but aside from the clear signs of violence, all of the tipped over furniture, we don't find anything here. So heading out and turning left, we find another ransacked room. This one even has a wall mounted safe, but it's empty. And there's nothing else in here. With the male dorm explored, we can turn around, head back upstairs and open the door to the female dorm. Like with the male dorm, this leads us downstairs. Hey, found you. We again have three rooms to explore, but all of these doors are open. We'll start by going to the left. The room to the left is empty, though the beds have all been pushed around. Heading back out and turning into the western room, we again find it completely empty. But while we're exploring, we get rushed from behind. Over here. Stand the sight of your own blood. Thankfully, Sharon is not to be messed with. There's nothing else in this room, so heading out, we can explore the final room. Inside the desk, we find a nuka cola and money, but otherwise it's empty. That's it for the female dorm. So heading out and turning east, we can go back upstairs and continue down the hallway to the south. This leads to another split. We can continue forward to go downstairs, turn left through a door or right through a door. We'll start by going left, and these are the bathrooms. This is the women's bathroom, and I checked all the stalls, but found nothing. So turning around and heading out, we can explore the men's restroom. We see the urinals, but again, there's nothing here. So to continue, we go back to the hallway and go down the southern staircase. At the bottom, we find another three-way split. We'll start by going to the right since this door is open. It's another bedroom. The most we find in here is 80 caps in a desk. Heading out, we can cross the hall to open this door, but oh wait, there's a note on the ground. To anyone who gets this, I don't know what happened. 
All of a sudden, everyone just started acting strange. The overseer told us to lock ourselves into our room and wait until security gets the riffraff under control. So that's what I'm doing. I managed to catch the security chief on his way past, and apparently the weirdos are so out of their head they can't read. So if you're not affected, say the word fanzini and I'll let you in. Well, that seems like a foolish plan. An insane survivor could simply overhear somebody saying the password and then use it themselves. Also, we find handwritten notes by these survivors. They're clearly insane, but they're also literate. Maybe they're only literate shortly after exposure. After all, the survivors all seemed rather easygoing and peaceful in their notes. Maybe the violence only comes much later. We find that the door is still locked with an average lock. Oh god, does that mean that they're still in there? After picking the lock? Oh no. We find two adult skeletons on the queen-sized bed, directly beneath a leaking pipe, pouring some sort of steam or smoke right onto them. Clearly, Vault Security never got the weirdos under control, or maybe the Vault Security became weirdos themselves. At any rate, no one ever came back to tell this couple that they were safe, and so they stayed here and starved to death. But turning around, oh, a child's bed, and on it the remains of a child. This whole family died, waiting for the insane survivors to leave, but they never did. Above the child's bed is a hard-locked, wall-mounted safe. Inside, we find a small amount of caps and ammunition. Heading out, we can turn left. This brings us to the final bedroom, but it's mostly empty. All we find is a small stash of caps and a locker. But with that, this room is a dead end, and we've fully explored this wing. To continue, we need to turn around, continue north, and all the way back up the stairs to the atrium. We can now open the door on the southern side of the atrium, where we saw that puddle of blood with the streaks going under the door. But this door is locked with an easy lock. After picking it, we can head inside and begin our descent again, down two more staircases until we round a corner to open the door to the Vault 106 Science Labs. On the other side of the door, we go down a staircase to a large hallway. We see a room through a window to the left, and another hallway leading to the right. Let's enter the room to the left. We open a door to the west. We find some sort of examination room, a large exam light on the ceiling, some lab tables tipped over, but nothing of interest in here. Heading out, we see a staircase to the northeast. We'll head down here first, heading down the staircase and rounding the corner. We could continue straight, but we see a hallway to the right. Going right first, we open a door to a large room. Good riddance. This was some sort of data storage room. We see large computers with big tape reels inside. There are two lockers here. We can find some low-level armor. And after looting a couple of toolboxes, we find a copy of Tumblr's Today lying on top of a big tipped-over computer. Heading out of this room and turning right down the hallway, we round a corner to find a door to the left. I've got one. Uh, uh, get him. Sharon and Dogmeat are on top of things. This was some sort of clinic, but sadly we don't find any first aid kits. Continuing down the hallway, we can follow a trail of blood down three more flights of stairs until we find a door with more blood on the ground. Opening the door, we find ourselves in another reactor room. But then to the west. <laughs> it's killing! Wait, what? Hey. The tunnel snake? Where? Butch? Ah! Ah! Wally? Paul? Ah! Fresh blood, just right for the taking. It's go time! Ah! This resident is wearing a vault tech scientist lab coat, and his name isn't Insane Survivor, it's just Survivor. And unlike all of the insane survivors in the vault, this one drops a finger. Why was this one evil, but the others weren't? Moving west through the doorway, we find a tipped over bookcase, a bunch of boxes, and a few more giant computer servers. And then heading through a western doorway, we step out into the cave. But stepping forward, we see a pile of human skeletons at the base of a pile of rocks. Were these vault dwellers murdered here? Murdered here possibly while trying to find a way to escape? 
If so, I wonder why they didn't go out the front door. After all, we found it unlocked. These guys had Pip-Boys. I'm sure they could have opened the door if anyone could. But then again, perhaps that way was blocked off. Guarded by security, or maybe the insane ones had already broken through. Maybe their only hope was to blast a way through this cave. But either they killed themselves, being crushed to death by a rock fall, or they were attacked while fleeing by insane survivors. To the left, we see a big metal shelf, and on the shelf, a number of ammo containers, a first aid kit, some darts. And on the bottom shelf, we see what appears to be a red pass card, but we can't interact with it. And on a top shelf here, we find a mini nuke. This, I believe, leads credence to the idea that these vault dwellers were trying to blast their way out. But they didn't blast their way out. This is a solid rock wall and a dead end, which means we have to retrace our steps. Turning around and heading out of the reactor, we can wind our way through the hallways and back up many flights of stairs until we get back to that floor where we chose to go down instead of east. This time, we'll turn east down the hallway. We come to another split, a staircase to the left, and a door to the right. But we don't have to open the door. It opens for us. Hey. Help me. Something. Goodness, that was a lot of them holed up in here. They were listening to Enclave Radio. We'll turn that off. There's a first aid kit on the shelf, some 308 caliber rounds on a bottom shelf, some buff out in a wooden box, some more 308 caliber rounds at the foot of a bed, and these beds are just tossed around the floor of this room. But before we can finish exploring, we hear another voice. Hello? Who's there? Ah, uh, there you go. Can I hit him? Where? After looting the final few containers and the bodies, we can head out of this room, turn right, and go east up a staircase. This leads us to yet another computer server room. And we find another reactor, and we find a whole bunch more pipes. And on the western wall, we find a door to the Vault 106 living quarters. On the other side of the door, we find ourselves inside that one room that we previously saw from the other side of those barred windows. It's a tiny room, and all we find in here is one security terminal. Inside, we find another urgent security notice, but this one is written to Vault Security Clearance B and Clearance C. Apparently the one we read in the terminal at the entrance was Security A, and they must not have had a very good security clearance. Today at 3.30 p.m., we're initiating control sequence 462A. We are unsure of the full effects of the gas release, so we request that anyone receiving this message head to their designated locations as noted in your C-11 form. The assigned locations were chosen for the cover and safety they provide, so do not vacate them unless dire circumstances arise. Remember to handle anyone acting abnormally according to the guidelines provided, and most importantly, immediately call for medical assistance. We thank you for your assistance during this brief test and assure you that the control is non-lethal and will be cleared from the air before 4 o'clock. The Overseer. So this wasn't an error in the ventilation system. That was a lie that he told to Vault Security A. The true story is that this was done on purpose. This vault's experiment was to gas their own residents for a period of 30 minutes with some sort of experimental gas to see what the effect would be. But it was so potent that that 30 minutes was all it took to turn many of the residents insane. On the desk next to this terminal is the Vault 106 Master Key. We can use this to access the Overseer's room and his terminal if we haven't already, but we have. And now we just need to get the heck out of here. Despite saying that the test was only gonna run for 30 minutes, the gas is still being pumped into this vault 200 years later. But that raises a question. This test was only supposed to last for 30 minutes. But we've been exploring this vault for much longer than 30 minutes. If many of the dwellers here went insane after being exposed for only 30 minutes, why are we not? 
While it's clear that some of the dwellers were biologically lucky, they just were immune to whatever gas was released here and didn't go crazy, as evidenced by the family we found still locked in their room all these years later. Or it could be that there was a malfunction. After all, the gas is still being pumped into the vault. Perhaps it was only supposed to be a 30-minute experiment, but something went wrong, causing the gas to continue to pump inside the vault long after the experiment was supposed to end, exposing the dwellers to a much higher dose of this stuff than vault Tech initially intended. As we read in the Overseer's Terminal, he didn't expect the vault dwellers to respond this way. He thought he was prepared for the worst. The system malfunctioned, continued to spray the dwellers until most of them went insane. The ones who didn't go insane died locked in their rooms or died trying to dig their way out. But we do have a problem here. We find skeletons all over the vault that have clearly been here for a very long time. But we also find insane survivors that are still alive and wearing Vault 106 jumpsuits. Does that mean that this vault survived nearly 200 years in perfect harmony, but only recently executed this ill-fated experiment? Well, no, this can't be, because Vault 106 is first mentioned in Fallout 2. In Fallout 2, we find a terminal talking about other vaults, and it mentions Vault 106, saying that it was designed so that 10 days after the door was sealed, it would begin releasing psychoactive drugs into the air filtration system. So this experiment happened only 10 days after the end of the world in 2077. If true, how can we explain the insane survivors still alive today? Well, there are a number of clues I think we can use to explain this. The first is that all of the insane survivors are not called vault dwellers. They are called survivors. Sure, it could be referring to vault residents who survived, or maybe it's referring to raiders, scavers, or mercenaries who wandered into the vault and survived. After all, the gas is still pumping all these years later. Support for this is that none of these insane survivors wear Pip-Boys. We know this wasn't a technical limitation for Bethesda. All of the Vault Dwellers in Vault 101 wear Pip-Boys. If they were Vault Dwellers, why did none of them have Pip-Boys? We already know from personal experience that the psychoactive drug instills a strong sense of wanting to stay in the vault and the person affected. Every terminal we read during our hallucination was trying to convince us to stay. Vault 106 was just such a nice place. We managed to wrench ourselves out of that hallucination, but what if these scavers didn't, and then sucked up so much of this stuff that they went homicidally insane, perhaps to protect their new cozy little home? One explanation for this, then, is that the event that killed these vault dwellers happened many years ago, and that the insane survivors we find are visitors like us who wandered in from the outside. Now, there are a few problems with this. The first is, if they are raiders who wandered into the vault, why are they wearing vault suits? Well, perhaps this is explained by all of the armor we find here in the vault. We find full suits of combat armor, merc armor, leather armor, and it's all stored in lockers scattered around the vault. Perhaps that was the armor worn by these raiders before they arrived at the vault. And when they arrived here, they were doused with this psychedelic drug, had an overwhelming craving to turn this place into their home. And what better way to make yourself feel at home in a vault than to wear a vault suit? Suit. And so they donned the clothing of the dead people they found scattered around them. This may explain why we don't find a single vault suit on any of the skeletons or in any of the containers. Another problem is that we find the vault door closed when we arrive, and if it's anything like Fallout 4, you have to have a Pip-Boy to open the door. How could raiders have opened the door? Well, it could be that they didn't have to. They found the door open. Maybe some of the original vault dwellers died trying to dig themselves out of the vault, but many others made their way out the front door. But naturally, we have no physical evidence of them. Then, once the raiders or scavengers got inside the vault, they closed the door from the inside. The final counter-argument I can think of, and probably the hardest one to dismiss, is the existence of the survivor at the very bottom of the vault. He's not an insane survivor, he's just a survivor, and he's wearing a vault Tech lab coat, not a Vault 106 jumpsuit like all of the other insane survivors. And he drops a finger. 
meaning that he's evil, and none of the insane survivors do. This gives us the impression, then, that all of the insane survivors would normally not be insane. They would be law-abiding, good vault dwellers if not for the fact that the psychedelic drug turned them insane. They're not naturally evil, evil on their own, but instead they have been drugged and manipulated into doing evil. That's why they don't drop fingers. It also gives us the impression that the survivor is the one responsible for this. Perhaps he is the scientist who developed this psychedelic drug and against the overseer's wishes, continued to pour it on the dwellers to see what would happen. He drops a finger when no one else here does because he's the real evil one, the man behind the experiment. But with that explanation, we now have to solve the still being alive after 200 years problem. Perhaps it really is a raider, maybe he's a more scientifically inclined raider. And while he and his raider gang were exploring this vault, he found the controls and for a kick, turned the vents back on. He never went crazy like the rest of his raider gang, who began to don the vault suits, but he thought he'd play along, so he put on a vault tech scientist lab coat. Or maybe we could make things easy for ourselves by saying that the psychedelic drug stops aging. Maybe these really are the original vault dwellers, and maybe this is the original vault tech scientist, and they have been around for these 200 years because one of the effects of the drug which they were testing was immortality. After all, the only ones we find dead are the ones who didn't go insane, the ones who resisted the effects of the drug. We ultimately don't know the true answer to this riddle, but it certainly is a whole lot of fun to think about. What do you think the answer is? How can we explain all of these insane survivors being alive 200 years after the experiment began? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. Who's a good boy? It's everyone's favorite German Shepherd, which you can find on a shirt in a variety of both men's and women's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can also find it on other products as well, smartphone cases, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon this week with a brand new episode.